Hello and welcome. You're watching Head to Head. I'm Carrie Oderman with UATV. U.S. President Donald Trump has signed an order imposing fresh sanctions on Russia over the poisoning of former Russian spy Sergei Skripal in England last year. Under the new sanctions, the U.S. will ban its banks from issuing loans to Russia and when necessary will oppose international banks extending loans to Russia. To discuss this and more, we welcome to our studio today Dr. Maxim Yakovla. Director of the School for Policy Analysis at the Kiev Moola Academy National University. Hello, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting. U.S.-Russian relationships has been very big in the news this week, first with the INF Treaty and now with the mm -hmm. new sanctions. Let's start with the sanctions. Can you give our viewers a background on why these sanctions are being brought around again? Well, interesting because I don't have a ready-made question. Uh, I think there is a political component to it because in the United States as well as in Europe, we're discussing all these issues around the interference of Russia into the presidential election campaign in the United States. Uh, broadly speaking, there is a discussion if there are any Russian ties or connections with the uh, uh, President Trump's administration, which is heavily discussed. On the other hand, we both understand that the political context in the United States for, for, for both parties and within there is a consensus that um, there is no way to pardon Russia for its aggressive uh, foreign policy, not only towards Ukraine, but we can also talk about Syria and the other things that uh, Russia does on the international arena. Even, you know, I would say uh, making these bad moves against its closest neighbors, you know, this provocation against Sweden a couple of years ago, like uh, with, the, with the jet flights and things like that. So I, I would say that there is a certain a political component. Maybe this reaction by Trump is a way to show that I'm not with Russia, so I'm not good friends with Putin, so to speak. And uh, Trump's position that he can easily negotiate different terms, it shows that there is, an, there is another crisis in United States-Russia relations, that there should be punishment for actions like Skripal case. You might question why, is it, why it took it almost a year for them to be imposed. So I think there is more politics to it. Although as a Ukrainian citizen, I do welcome all the international activities within, with st sanctions imposing them on Russia, because we understand that this, um, I, I looked into the Russian direction, especially by Russian mainstream media, that um, is no problem, uh, Russia is rich, we have enough money and things like that. But we saw that previous sanctions and sanctions that are still in action, um, even very specific sanctions, like, for example, some of them make it more complicated for Russia to produce oil and gas. So oil and gas extraction even is complicated because there are some uh, very sophisticated machinery for, for which Russia does not produce the, com the components, so Russia has to import them. With banks and sanctions like that, maybe there is a move for uh, something that uh, many politicians, we can, we can talk about if they are radical or not, discuss this idea if Russia would be cut off from SWIFT and banking transfer, transfer mechanisms and Visa, MasterCard or other ways to really uh, transfer money. Because as we know, this Russian situation where the many politicians who are in favor of Russian aggressive foreign policy, their families reside, study and basically live abroad, not in Russia. So they benefit from stealing from the Russian people living abroad. So within this banking move, potentially the more radical way would be in the future to punish Russia even more with um, limiting access to international banking transactions. Now, U.S. President Donald Trump certainly sends mixed signals on Russia. True. Speaking as a Russian citizen, I'm sure you're happy the more attention that's being brought to the sanctions that the U.S. often justifies because of Russia's actions in the Crimea. Now, President Trump's hand was forced a bit, though, with the second round of sanctions because it's based on a domestic U.S. law, a 1991 law, which is called the Biological Weapons Control and War Warfare Elimination Act. This requires a U.S. president to, ha to um, create sanctions or um, pass sanctions on to a country that uses something like Novichok. Mm -hmm. um, so is it fair to say that maybe President Trump isn't coming out hard on Russia? He has to legally do this? True, but then the question is about timing. Why now and not two months ago, half a year ago? How long does it take for a bill like that to be passed using the American legal system within all those difficulties? So there are many questions, but I agree with you that the, if we say that he has no choice and his relationship or his attitude towards Putin, we do understand then from a psychological perspective, I'm speaking of very simplified, yes, he has this adoration in terms maybe Trump wished he could 
behave like Putin, you know, being a dictator, not limited by uh, structures and systems. But the, many people, in, in, even in Ukraine, were, were like, you know, having this post-Soviet attitude. When there is a leader, he makes everything he wants. But we do understand that the United States is a powerful nation because it has very strong institutions that limit uh, actions even of the, uh, the president. Checks and balances are always there. Unlike in Russia, where Putin is seen as a person with, uh, with, with full possible power. So maybe there is this one attitude. Uh, but secondly, I do understand that with all this psychological peculiarities of President Trump, he has to act a certain way because of the uh, expectations. And it's true that Russia behaves aggressively. And uh, I think that from a very simple perspective, if you look at the Russian's reaction, for them, um, any any action taken by the United States, you know, to to somehow um, soften its attitude towards Russia is seen in military term as a step back, you know, as losing the position. So the, he is certainly caught both with the legislation potentially, but also with this uh, popular attitude and with also Russian position, because I, I do trust that, uh, that Trump has good advisors who know how to bring about the ideas that the Russian perception is that we are in a new wave of a Cold War. And there is this contestation There's, that there are no other ways for him to behave, basically. Well, the State Department and the Treasury Department had the sanctions package, as you may know, prepared already two months ago. Now we're in August, and he's finally just endorsed this. Um, he spoke with Vladimir Putin on Wednesday. In that conversation, he offered help for the Siberian fires. What else do you think that conversation looked like in light of the treaty, the INF treaty, and now these sanctions. How do you think that conversation went? I, I, I do get that your hint is maybe there was not a good conversation in both. <laughs> he may be able to play both sides of the fence by going back to this 1991 act. He would have to say then, I needed to do this with the sanctions, but on the other hand, I'm offering help with Siberia as a sign of goodwill and to strengthen our relationship. It was very interesting because in many Russian mainstream media, which can be really prepared to state propaganda, there was a very interesting reaction that um, the United States offered us the help and we might use it. Some of the previous, it was almost impossible to hear something like that, you know, that somebody offered us help, but we can, this is all with the Russian submarine and um, stuff like that. We really, like, uh, we decided that we can solve our problems on our own, but that was a very interesting thing, like, we might use that help. And of course, uh, Trump stresses his ability to be a good negotiator. And negotiate both sides and you know play with this but um, I do doubt that this conversation was that important in terms of content maybe it was like exchange of uh, like ideas or attitudes because finally the results are that as far as I know as of now Russia is not using uh, American help to solve this problem with the fires in Siberia secondly the sanctions are imposed and this uh, treaty on weapons is also the, the both sides withdrawal so uh, based on the results we cannot say that this conversation was productive. Now, in your opinion, is the second round, this economic sanctions, are they more harder hitting than the first round? You know, I'm not an economist myself, so I, it's difficult for me to judge. So I, this, I, you know, to be consequent in what I'm saying, we have to look at the results, what is going to happen. As I said, the more radical one would be really harder restriction on Russia's uh, potential, potential to use the banking transactions. But we do understand that Russia also has a lack on investments in many spheres within the country. And I think it's a bad sign, it is always a bad sign when you earn a lot of money, when you get money by different fraudulent schemes or p from corruption. But the only thing you use your money for is to build huge castles. You know, this is something that I, I do sp speak of a classical oligarch picture that you might have in the West. So. The person really stole money from the pop basically from the people. But then to use this money, built a huge castle. So uh, with the same as with the former Asian republics of the Soviet Union, where you have the money, money are sent back to the families, is sent back to the families. And the things that this, uh, uh, especially in Tajikistan and countries like that, uh, the women and the families left that they don't know what to use the money for. And they, again, built huge houses, So, which is a bad idea. Why I'm saying this, in Russia there is a problem that there is an inner market because so many, so many, there is money laundry, of course. And maybe the stress, the most positive way that Russia might use this stress is to question the inner economic situation, where the, all these castles come from. Maybe this money could be invested in some business, 
in some infrastructure projects and things like things like that. So um, to answer your questions, to your question, we have to look at the development. But I think it is a good sign for Russia to rethink at least, especially with the protests in Moscow and this local election for uh, Moscow City Council. Maybe the, it would come to this point at which uh, the population of Russia, it, which is actually a great country and a nation with huge potential, but these things are used for military foreign aggression and to build castles within the country where the population is really poor. Let's talk about Moscow for a minute, because mm -hmm. the, is there a connection to how Sergei Skripal was treated was that foreshadowing to how Moscow and the Kremlin would treat its own citizens? But you would agree there is nothing new in that. It's really the, the, um, the way, um, especially uh, Yulia Latinina, we can have different attitudes to, to how she's commenting on things, but she really has this question like you have in Siberia fires, the Russian nation, the National Guard, the National um, National Guardia, the point is to like to protect the the regime from its own people, I think she mentioned that the, there are 350 people, uh, 350,000 people in this organization, but she said that's why you have no people or resource, human resources basically, to deal with the fire in Siberia because you have so many people in Moscow arresting with the first round of arrests, more than 13,000 people arrested in Moscow only. So this is, uh, this is incredible. So I would say the, the regime is trying to protect itself from its uh, citizen, citizens. We cannot be that, you know, um, the, um, to, to speak in very mythical terms that the Russian population against Putin. Putin is still popular as a leader, as an example, but uh, there is, there's, now there's a stage at which we are questioning the democracy in Russia from within. If people are even not allowed to participate in election, this is the first restriction. And uh, so maybe to answer your question, yes, the things are interrelated because the Russian, um, the idea of Russian, um, the, both the police, um, uh, P police, um, all the structures that are using force and state imposed power, they are used not to protect the citizens, but actually to protect the regime from the citizen. And this is a very wrong system. It has to change. There is no other way. Politics is very unpredictable right now, but we do have a few givens. Both the U.S. and the U.K. are on the same side when it comes to the Skripal affair and sanctions. Just today, the British head of the uh, PACE delegation has asked to reconsider Russia being welcomed back into the Council of Europe. How can the Ukraine utilize this point in history and politics right now to its advantage? Well, I hope, we, well, very good question, but we have to agree that the United States and the United Kingdom, how, um, they had always had this particular friendship tie and bond, so this interesting international relations. Um, Actually, this is a resource that can be used by media. I'm heading for London uh, this weekend to participate in a conference on media and resources, how we use them. So it, it is very important to use it as a tool in negotiation. But you have to, uh, I, I think you would agree that uh, Russia is now back to the parla parliamentary delega delegation within Council of Europe. The reason, one of the explanations, which I found it was really, you know, uh, it was almost as, as if, uh, for me, it was almost insanity. To, the explanation was, we need to get Russia back in order to protect the Russian citizen, to have at least the mechanism. Russia is now back, and we have over 13,000 people in Moscow arrested. So, and beatings, they're all online. So you can really watch it and you it's see. It's quite so, graphic, yes. Yes, it, it, it is really um, almost, as I repeat, it is some form of insanity. So this explanation doesn't work. And I think the Ukrainian diplomacy, okay, we have to agree that in Ukraine, we're now discussing um, the future of our uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, because we have a new, relatively new president elected. Uh, we have the parliamentary election for the first time in Ukrainian history, the, a very, really huge faction in the parliament. So what is going to happen? Who is going to lead the foreign policy? We still have to wait for it. But uh, to answer your question in a simple sentence, yes, we have to use this opportunity to show that it was a wrong decision. And it has, it, this decision was based on false premises. It is not about protecting the rights of Russian citizens. And quickly, how could President Zelensky use this moment in the most opportune way? There are so many opportunities that he's missing right now already. I do understand that with parliamentary action, he really, he, you know, he kept quiet because if he took any political stance, an ideological stance, that would scare off a part of his electorate. But I, I'm, I, I'm always saying that I'm an optimist. So I would like um, President Zelensky to really learn how to participate in the national arena, to be more vivid, because he's interesting. Our foreign partners are interested in meeting him. 
because you know as some say he is the future of the European leaders they might come at some point in their career they might come across a, a rival like Zelensky a person who worked as a comedian who really made fun of the politician and now he's the president of a relatively large European nation well, there's a lot to talk about here, and unfortunately, we didn't get to cover most of the treaty. We'll have you back again. I appreciate it. That was Dr. Maxim Yakovlev, Director of the School for Policy Analysis at the Kiev Mohoyla Academy National University. Thank you for watching Head to Head, and stay tuned for more.